Good afternoon. My name is Luis Lopez, Associate Vice President for Hispanic and Brazilian Relations. It is great to be here in New Orleans celebrating the annual meeting of our convention. Today we have a very interesting panel discussion about making evangelism a priority in the church. This is a very needed and relevant topic in our convention today. We have a great panel of three very distinguished pastors from different locations in our country. First, we have Pastor Gilberto Corredera from Preston Wood and Espanol in Plano, Texas. Then we have Pastor Joshua Del Risco, pastor of Iglesia Bautista Vida Nueva in Fultondale, Alabama. And third, we have Pastor Julio Crespo of Iglesia Bautista Central in Oklahoma City. Thank you, brothers, for being here. Let me start welcoming everyone who is listening to us right now. And there are many things competing with the agenda of the church today. Too many things are on the plate. And evangelism, it seems like, is not getting to be the priority. My first question to you, and I want you to start, Brother Gilberto, is why should evangelism be a priority in the church today? Well, thank you for the question. I think as evangelism have to be the priority of the church. Number one is because the plan of the redemption of God through the local church has to do with proclaiming the gospel. In Acts chapter 1, when Christ is about to leave, he told the disciples, go and be a testimony. You know, it's the mission of the church to proclaim the gospel. And evangelism is also the proclamation of the gospel. This is one number one reason. Number two, I think, is the eternity of so many people mm. depends on our proclamation of the gospel. Mm. In Romans chapter 10, the Apostle Paul says, how they will believe if they don't hear the gospel. And how will they hear the gospel is we don't teach, tell the gospel. So uh, the eternity of so many people uh, depends on the proclamation of the gospel, I think. Yes, I, I agree. It is the task and priority of the church. Mm -hmm. And it is every believer's call to share the good news, regardless of one's spiritual gifts. Yep. Many times someone may say, well, that's not my giftedness. Mm. But we're all called to take the good news of Jesus Christ to those that are around us. Wow. Also, I would add that the, through the gospel, the church is being built. Mm -hmm. So without the gospel, there's no church. So yeah, the, right. the church, you know, the foundation of the church is the gospel. Mm -hmm. Yes, I would add it's the lifeline of New Testament growth that we want to see in churches where there's a new church plant or an existing church. Evangelism is that, that uh, uh, conduit by which people come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I want to add another reason is mm -hmm. uh, the second coming of the Lord <laughs> is every day uh, closer. So is the, I will say that we are in the final lap and we need to share the gospel until he came. Mm. So... Churches get distracted when there are so many things trying to get our attention. Yep. The question is, how then do we keep evangelism a priority in the church? I would say that it's vital that evangelism be an integral part of the DNA of the church. It needs to permeate every aspect, every activity that the church has. It has to be the conduit by which people come to the Lord. So it's not a one-time event. Uh, it is uh, a lifestyle. And everything that the church does, activity-wise, program-wise, should be uh, a, a door for people to come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Uh, I also would say that it needs to be uh, taught and modeled by uh, our leaders. Uh, it's an essential part of the church's discipleship program. It's not a, a separate uh, training. It is part of discipleship of raising that next generation of soul winners. Could you unpack that a little bit more about, you know, walking the walk? Yes, um, I believe that 
we we are all surrounded by individuals that need to hear the message of Jesus Christ. Uh, God has placed us strategically in different areas of life, and uh, we can't, I, I, as a pastor, I can't be everywhere my church members are at. So as a pastor, my calling is to equip them that they might live in an uh, evangelistic lifestyle by modeling it to them, by taking them with me. Uh, I believe that evangelism is more caught than it is taught. Hmm. We can teach evangelism and it stays in the classroom wow. or I can take someone with me and it's contagious to see a life being transformed by the gospel. Hmm. If I could add, I would say also we have to build a culture of, of evangelism, a culture of the gospel in our church. And how, and what does that mean to well, build the culture? That, that would mean where we're constantly feeding the gospel to each other. Because the gospel is not only for the lost, but it's also for us to encourage us to continue in the faith. So as the church is constantly preaching the gospel to itself, it's going to be natural to preach the gospel to others. And as, as we're building that culture of always looking out for each other, evangelizing each other to evangelize others, mm -hmm. that it, it's just going to be a natural flow. Yeah, I will add to that because think about the concept of gospel is good news. Mm -hmm. So as we have a good news, this is our first priority. Tell mm -hmm. others about the good news that we have in Christ. And so I think as understanding the gospel help us to understanding, no, yes, the concept of salvation also the mission mm. of redemption mm. and the good news that we have in Christ. I think is this is why we need to keep pushing and doing uh, the work of the evangelism of the church. Hmm. One thing that I have noticed is that sometimes pastors and church leaders who are trying to make evangelism a priority in the church, they get discouraged. They get uh, discouraged because they don't see people embrace evangelism as a priority or as a, as a lifestyle. My question to you is, what advice would you give these leaders about that? I is was, there hope? Yeah, well, definitely there's hope. I mean, the gospel is about hope. So it's, there, there is hope. Uh, I, was, I was thinking about uh, 2 Timothy, how there's in... Second Timothy chapter four, there appears to be a discouragement from the preaching of the gospel. So in Second Timothy two four two, Paul tells Timothy, preach the word, be ready in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke and exhort and complete patience with complete patience and teaching. And then he says, for the time will come when people will not endure sound teaching. So mm. there's going to be a time where people just don't. And I think this is in the present. It's, I mean, he's talking about your church that you're at, Timothy, is going to go through a season where they're not going to endure mm -hmm. sound teaching. Yep. So what's the cure? Well, Paul tells Timothy, what's the cure in verse 5? As for you, always be sober-minded. In other words, keep, keep focused on what we have to do. If you're gonna, the one reason we get distracted or we get discouraged is we lose focus that we have to keep teaching. We have to keep teaching. Second thing, he says, endure suffering. Well, it's going to cost us that's not easy that's not easy nobody likes to suffer but that's <laughs> part of the calling and the third thing is here's the one i want you to want to emphasize do the work of an evangelist fulfill your ministry so you know, a way to this uh, way to remove discouragement is keep going at it keep evangelizing keep doing the work yeah. hmm wow Let's talk about some of the challenges pastors face in making evangelism a priority. Well, I'm a pastor and I want to get that one, this one. <laughs> <laughs> that is the thing. We have uh, three main reasons uh, that I find on my ministry. And you can add more, of, of course. We have three main reasons that we found when we try to go hard on evangelism. Number one is the spiritual welfare. So when wow. we are talking about evangelism, we're talking about an, a spiritual welfare because we are trying to rescue the lost. And we have an opposition that is in a spiritual opposition that is real. If mm. we don't believe that, we have to be out of ministry. So there has to be an awareness, awareness. of their spiritual warfare. E even, even we have to start evangelism with prayer. But not for the lost people. 
for the safe people that they're confused <laughs> that right. they need to have the gospel, they need to preach the gospel. So mm. it's a spiritual warfare. It's number one. Number two, and sorry about this, it's I don't want to step in nobody else's feet, but this is we have a bad ecclesiology. Mm. Could you unpack that? Yes. The way <laughs> that we've been doing church for so many years have been against evangelism. Mm -hmm. Because why? Mm -hmm. Sometimes church is a lot of programming. Mm -hmm. And when pastors get to a church with full of programming, that everybody's competing uh, with uh, for the attention of the congregation. Everybody want to be in women ministry, children ministry, this ministry, the other ministry. So what happened is, is evangelists is not a priority. We'll get as a first as a last priority, a last. right? Very few so are, that means that the programming that we have in churches sometimes hurt evangelist, evangelism. Wow. And third, I will say that this, we don't celebrate enough. Mm -hmm. When someone shares the gospel, I make, mm. and someone make a profession of faith. Wow. Uh, we don't true. celebrate enough when someone is giving their life to Christ. I think the church have to go back again and say we need to celebrate when someone is sharing the gospel and when and someone is making a profession of faith and make their first priority. And, uh, and, and tell us how we can celebrate that because a lot of people, you know, we, we think on, of evangelism that we celebrate when the person makes the decision for Christ, but we don't celebrate enough no, the fact that people are faithful in sharing. The thing is we need to celebrate when somebody shares their faith. Because yeah. God is never asking yeah. us to convert people. Right. He's asking us to be witness. And as you say later, early, you say this. He said, everybody don't have the gift of evangelism, but everybody have the responsibility to be a witness. Right. So we have to start celebrating in church when someone shared the gospel without the results. Because faithfulness is what's required to share the gospel. Be faithful and let God, that, you know, We'll do the rest. So I don't know if you want to add. Luis, I, I'll add something probably from a more, from a more practical perspective. Uh, many times in a ministry, in a pastorate, you have the toll of an administration uh, responsibility. Right. Sometimes even a poor time management so that, yep. as you said, evangelism is the last thing on our list. We don't <laughs> have time to get to it. And I would encourage pastors uh, in, in a sense of an accountability to have a evangelism coach or mentor, someone that can keep you accountable, can encourage you, can be a prayer partner in the focus of evangelism. And that, that, that would be very helpful for a pastor who's trying, who's struggling to be more uh, uh, intentional and, and faithful in that way. Wow, that sounds very good. If I, if I could add, I, I know as Hispanic pastors, we all have something in common here with the people that we're shepherding. And as our people are very fearful, they're, and I think that's a challenge for us is that fear that they have to share the gospel. Yep. Mm -hmm. And how do we get them out of that to, to go out and share the gospel? Because our people are loving. You know, they, they, they love to be in close quarters. They, they like to be in community. How do we get them to not fear share the gospel when they're having a quinceañera, when they're having uh, family over or things that or, you know, things right. that, that we do as Hispanic people? Yeah. Uh, how, I think that's a big challenge. But we overcome it by think again by having a gospel culture a lifestyle of evangelism yeah that is permeating in everything we do wow that's important and i think brother julio i think what you're saying it, it, it doesn't only apply to hispanics i think most people are fear mm -hmm. or have some type of fear in sharing the gospel so i, yeah. I think that's very clear now from a leadership perspective now, talking about what you as a leader can do in your church, whether you are a pastor or you are a leader that serves in, different, in a different area, what can you do to make evangelism a priority? I would say as a pastor to continue to cast vision, as well encourage your members to evangelize, equipping them not only in one method or one approach, but in, in more than one. We've all, God's created us all in, in, with a different yeah. personality, temperament, 
uh, experiences. And so some people may gravitate to one approach more than another. So offering uh, various approaches may uh, encourage them to participate, guiding them in how to have uh, spiritual conversations. Hmm. Uh, what uh, Brother Julio was saying, our people are already in conversations with the loss at work and in their neighborhood. How do you guide uh, your conversations to be more spiritual, focused on Jesus Christ? I would say for pastors to give effective evangelistic invitations, uh, to know how to draw the net. Could you explain that more? Yes. um, Whether it be in a sermon, a message, or a Bible study, we uh, sometimes lose the opportunity to draw the net and mm-hmm. help lead people to, to Christ. Mm-hmm. The Apostle Paul, the New Testament, tells us that Paul persuaded people to Christ. And so I believe in the, in the uh, public invitation, yes. the opportunity for people to make a public decision for Christ. It's affirming, it confirms their decision, it helps the church also to come around them and undergird them and encourage them. So, yes, and also to celebrate them. To yeah. celebrate those decisions. And, and equipping people, going back to what you were saying, Brother Joshua, you were saying equipping people to draw the net. Because a lot of times people expect that the pastor is the one who's going to draw the net. Right. But whether you are in a Bible study or whether you're talking with a friend somewhere else. Yeah. I mean, we are to, to equip people yeah. to and know least, how to draw the net. Not, and, and I would say even in the context of the church uh, programming, um, If someone walked into our churches uh, on a Sunday morning uh, in Sunday school, many times they have to wait till 11 o'clock, 1130 when the invitation (laughs) is given, if an invitation is given, to make a decision for Christ. But if we can train our Sunday school teachers, our small group leaders on how to uh, uh, give a biblical uh, gospel invitation... We'll have people making decisions for Christ in Sunday school and small group. Yeah, before the before service. And then in the service, all, they're just going to be making that public. That's and right. So I think that's important. Um, I would also say that it's important to, to, to pray for the lost. Mm. We pray for many things. Paul in Romans chapter 10 said that the desires of his heart and his prayer was for the salvation of his people. And so I think prayer for the lost is important. And keeping uh, that before our people. That's something we can all do. And helping then helping our church not only to pray for the lost, but what do you do to then be a conduit for them to come to knowledge of Jesus Christ? Wow. Our prayer meetings could be changed if we're praying for the lost. Amen. Amen. That's good. That's good. Anybody else wants to add anything about that? What other uh, advice would you give to... I'll oh, go, go ahead. Well, I was just going to add, thank you, Julio. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, something that I see missing in churches, uh, and this is something that in our church I try to practice and encourage in our people, is to bring their lost friends and family. Mm. If I'm preaching and I give a gospel invitation and there's no one there except the members of the church, right. there's not going to be any decision. So I, I encourage our people to bring their lost friends and family. It's like fishing. I love the fish. I don't know how to clean the fish. So I have to take it to someone who knows how to clean it. And I say, if you don't know how to share your gospel yet, you haven't been trained, then you at least can bring them to someone who knows how to clean them, Mm -hmm. uh, clean them spiritually. And so uh, bringing your lost friends, encouraging our churches to do that, our church members, will also give then an encouragement for the pastor or the preacher to give that gospel invitation. If I could Brother press, Holy, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, something with what Joshua said is very interesting is about teaching the gospel. I think that's that needs to be a priority, too, yeah. is uh, as leaders. We have to teach the gospel to people. Yeah. I'm not 100 percent convinced, but I'm getting there that most people don't know, don't know the gospel. Mm. I, you know, we talk a lot about the gospel. What is the gospel? You know, uh, do we know about who God is? Do we know? Well, who we are as sinners, do we know that Christ came to save sinners from their sins, that he died, that he rose again, and that he's coming back, and that if we repent and believe in Christ, we can be saved. Very simple. Okay? People articulate that, mm-hmm. and we got to help people to understand how to articulate it. And I think part of it can come when we're preaching it. The more we're preaching that message, mm-hmm. the more people will grasp, grasp it. it. Yeah. 
That's yeah. Good. Pastors and leaders need to be reminded so many times of, of things that we need to do to keep evangelism the main thing. What advice would you give to somebody who is listening to us right now uh, to take the next step? I would say some churches have programs and they're good. But I would start changing them to be gospel programs. Yep. What do you mean by that? Set the central uh, push of every program is the gospel. And we're working together. For example, children's ministry. Sometimes we have great children's ministry where they're, where they're well taken care of. But a lot of times the gospel is not proclaimed to them. Yep. And we got to step it up. Tell, tell our, our leaders, make sure that when you're done teaching, you share the gospel with these kids. Yesterday, I was at a meeting, and they asked this question, which I thought was powerful. Mm. He said, how many of you were saved from 11 and below? I say 70% of the people stood up. Wow. And then he said, how many of you were saved because your mother shared the gospel with you? Yep. Wow. And only a few sat down. So there's something to be said about sharing the gospel from young age. Mm. And teaching people to do that, teaching the, 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 uh, the children's workers to share the gospel. So start small, start there. Wow. Brother Julio, that is so important what you just said. Would you give us some advice about children's ministry? How do we make sure that it's gospel-centered? Well, obviously, we want to look at the material, make sure that it's nothing yeah. crazy. But, you know, we have good material in, in our Southern Baptist world. But the other one is, like, like uh, Joshua said, let's, we've got to train our workers. Yeah. So let's teach them the gospel. Let's teach them to share it. Uh, do workshops with them. Uh, take them out. And one of the things we do in our church is we, we go and uh, we go to a place where there's a lot of Hispanics and we do open air evangelism and go for it. Yeah, I would jump on this because we have the experience in our church that mm -hmm. we were doing a great children ministry, running like uh, 300 uh, children's every Sunday and everything. But we uh, find out and say, okay, we are teaching Daniel Old Testament books to these kids and these nines. But the question is, how many of these kids are saved? Mm. So we stop everything. We go to a training process to teach our Sunday school teachers how to share the gospel and we make stop in what our curriculum and we start sharing the gospel with the kids wow and let me tell you their response was incredible wow. because we are assuming that the kids that are in church are safe hmm. but they are not hmm. so what we did is we equip our teachers we stop the curriculum and we start doing the gospel presentation and we got a great response a great uh, opportunity to see kids get saved and later get them in the waters wow. be baptizing so my adding to what you are saying is we need to make sure that in every program in the church mm -hmm. every leader in the program in the church have as a first priority gospel presentation gospel conversation and gospel invitation because mm. sometimes we do gospel conversation uh -huh. even we do gospel presentation right but we get a little short and do the invitation you know, it's, 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 you know, it's closing the deal. It's giving people the opportunity to respond to the gospel right there. As you were saying early in the, uh, in the conversation, they don't have to wait at the end of the service. Is you equip your people, they can invite someone. Do you want to make that decision right now mm. with me right here? And that is powerful for a church. Yes, Luis, I would also add that it's important for pastors and leaders to keep the main thing, the main thing, to live an evangelistic lifestyle, to model evangelism for the church members. That may be going to Walmart and telling the cashier, uh, Maria, you know, Maria works at the Walmart. <laughs> Has anyone told you today that Jesus loves you? Hmm. And maybe going to the restaurant and asking the waiter, how can I pray for you? It begins to open doors to plant the seed of the gospel. 
But if we live an evangelistic lifestyle, our church members will see our example and, and follow it. If I'm not evangelistic, I can't expect my church members to uh, be do that and, mm. and keep it a priority in our church. So it starts with us as leaders to, to, to live that lifestyle and to model it for them. Mm. Thank you for saying that. And I appreciate so much what you were talking about, you know, reaching, you know, with the reaching children. But... Can any one of you give some advice about how to keep the next generation, the youth, yeah. well, being I evangelized? Would, yeah, I, I would say that it's important for leaders to be real. Mm. Uh, our young people are looking for people that are, are that that are real, that they are living what they preach. Yeah. So our lifestyle is important, um, and and to try just to build those bridges of uh, communication, build bridges of love to our young people. Our young people need the gospel, yeah. and they're looking for hope everywhere. We have that hope. We have the message of hope. And so uh, they're, they're open if we approach them in a way that uh, is attractive to them. We don't have to have a mohawk or have tattoos. They just want us to be real. Model what you yeah. say. Be who you say you are as believers mm -hmm. in Christ. I would add it. That, that's good. Uh, the ethos of the gospel has been lost. Like we, we yes, we proclaim it. But what about live it? Right. Yeah. You know, first, first Peter chapter three, P Peter talks about giving a defense of the gospel or giving a defense of our hope. Yeah. But before that, he say those who ask you. And people who ask is because they observe something from you. Mm. They observe something that's different about you. And I think the ethos of the gospel needs to be back in the plate. Like it's both and it's how you live and how and what you say. Then they should come they should be together. And our young people want that. They're looking. Yeah. I mean, they they have social media. They have all these ways of seeing different things. Mm -hmm. And we need to tell them the gospel, but we have to live the gospel. They have to see that we're real. You know, we yes, right. we're sinners, we fall, we repent, but they need to see us being real. Mm -hmm. and, and in some active. cases, they're waiting to be equipped or well, to be modeled. Like I, you I would were jump at this because this is in my heart. Uh, let me tell you this, Luis, about the next generation. I think it's the local church have a debt uh, with the next generation of the young generation. Uh, the, our ecclesiology, I go back to the same, but let me explain this. We have the best equipped pastor working with the adult, right? And almost in many churches. The best equipped pastor is working with the adult. The full-time pastor is working with the adult. And who is working with our teenagers and who are uh, the, the college students? A volunteer, maybe as a, the pastor's son or kid, okay, can you help us here? And children is the same, you know, pastor wife or somebody else who take care. So, but the thing is, the adults already have their faith built. So this is why they are in your church. But and the kids and the next generation have a lot of challenges with worldview, identity, and so many stuff that the world is sending in their way to change their mind. And we don't pay attention to that. Sometimes we invest more in the adults and we invest so little in the next generation. What happened is, is we want to reach the next generation. We have to flip the coin. And we have to put more resources to share the gospel and equip with the gospel yeah. the next generation. The, the teenagers, the 12 years old, the 8 years old, the 15 years old, that they are going through a lot through social media. Man, one hour in the church against yeah. the time that they spend here, yeah. I think is we need to wake up church and invest in the next generation. So you want to reach it for Christ because they can make a difference. Yeah. Right. One last question. What are some of the best practices that you can see in churches that are making evangelism a priority? Well, number one, I would say that uh, the heart of the pastor. The what? The heart of the pastor. The senior pastor has to have a heart for evangelism. Right. And let me tell you this. Uh, the pastor giving a public invitation every Sunday is crucial. You were saying, well, uh, is the members bring past uh, new uh, friends to church, I will give an invitation. Well, I will say this to all the pastors. 
you can now assume that the people that you have in your church do really know the gospel and they are saved. So step number one, I think you start with the pastor. Pastor have to have a heart for the lost people. And every Sunday, a public invitation will give people the opportunity to understand the gospel and also to respond based on what they understand to the gospel. Number two, I will say that lifestyle, you mentioned it, lifestyles. We need to model that when we go to, to Walmart, to a restaurant, we need to leave it out. We need to model that, start gospel conversation. Number three, I will say and say it again a hundred times, we need to celebrate more professional faith. We need to make very public when people make professional faith because this is what we are all about, S preaching the gospel, see, being people say, being safe. And number three, uh, number four, I will say, we need to create more opportunities and more spaces in our local churches for training. People don't share the gospel. One of the reasons, you know why you say it early, they have fear. I don't know how to do yeah. it. I never been equipped how to do it. And what about if someone asks me a question? I don't know how to respond to that. So churches, pastors, we need to create spaces that people can get equipped gaining confidence to share the gospel and after that we need to encourage them to do it that's right that's right i don't want to add to that thank you so very much for your time for your input this has been a fascinating discussion and we could go for hours but we thank you very much for your presence here and for your input and until next time god bless you thank you <laughs>